Egypt by Anne Heinrichs. Question of the week: Why is it important to understand ancient civilizations? Land of the Pharaohs. People were farming along the Nile as early as 7,000 B.C. Eventually, they settled into two kingdoms: Upper Egypt in the south and Lower Egypt in the northern delta. In about 3100 B.C., Menes, a king of Upper Egypt, united the two kingdoms. Menes was honored as Egypt's first pharaoh or king. The word pharaoh comes from the words per a, meaning big house. Pharaohs liked to keep their power in the family. Ancient Egypt was governed by one dynasty or ruling family after another. Thirty-one dynasties of pharaohs reigned in Egypt between 3100 B.C. and 332 B.C. Levels of society: the pharaoh and his family were at the top rung of Egyptian society. They lived in great luxury: alabaster lamps, golden beds and chairs, and exotic woods inlaid with ivory decorated their homes. Servants took care of their every need. Musicians and dancers amused guests at their lavish banquets. Other members of the upper class were priests, nobles, doctors, and high-ranking army officers. Artisans, merchants, and engineers made up the middle class. Scribes or professional writers held a special place of honor. Every family hoped to have a son who would become a scribe. The scribes wrote letters and government documents and recorded the pharaoh's decrees. The common people were farmers, laborers, and soldiers. Farming took only part of the year, so many farmers spent several months working on the pharaoh's construction projects. Love and marriage. In ancient Egypt, love was an important part of marriage. Egyptians wrote beautiful love poems and songs. Druggists mixed love potions to help people charm their beloved. Pharaohs could keep several wives. But one wife was customary for everyone else. Women in ancient Egypt had more rights than women in many cultures have today. They could own property, buy and sell goods, and inherit wealth. Wives could even sue for divorce if they had a good reason. Homes, adornments, and games. Most people lived in simple houses made of mud bricks. Very few of these houses remain today. Centuries of rain and wind have swept the soft materials away. In these simple homes, people sat and slept on woven mats on the floor. Candles and oil lamps provided light at night. Wealthy people had beautiful homes with dozens of rooms. Some were built around courtyards with gardens and pools. Women kept their makeup in tiny bowls and jars. Cosmetics were made from minerals and plants. Gypsum was mixed with soot. To make a sparkly eye shadow, a black substance called coal was used as an eyeliner. Other substances made red coloring for lips and blush for cheeks. Women also painted their fingernails and wore hair ornaments. Upper class women wore earrings, bracelets, armbands, and necklaces of gold and precious stones. Both men and women wore lightweight linen skirts or robes. Lower class people went barefoot. While the upper classes wore leather sandals, shoulder-length head coverings protected workers from the heat of the sun. Upper-class men and women wore wigs. On festive evenings, women sometimes wore a cone of perfumed animal fat on their heads. As the night wore on, the fat melted, drenching them with sweet-smelling oil. Ancient paintings and artifacts show how much the Egyptians loved games. Children played leapfrog and tug of war. Girls played catch with a ball, sometimes while riding piggyback. Wooden toys included monkeys on horseback and animals on wheels. Grown-ups played a game called senat by moving pieces on a checkered board. They played snake on a round board shaped like a coiled snake. Ancient cuisine. Egyptians ate using the first three fingers of the right hand. A typical meal might include vegetables such as broad beans, lentils, peas. Cucumbers or cabbage. People also enjoyed onions, garlic, turnips, and lettuce. Their fruit trees yielded figs, dates, and pomegranates. Other favorite fruits were melons and grapes. 
hunters went into the desert for wild game, such as antelope and gazelle. In marshy areas, they shot ducks and geese with bows and arrows. Quail, pigeon, and beef were grilled or roasted. Fish from the Nile were salted or hung out to dry. Food was sweetened with honey collected from beehives. Bread was a basic everyday food. Pharaohs and nobles had their own bakeries. In most homes, women ground wheat and barley into flour and baked the loaves in clay pots or beehive-shaped clay ovens. A wall relief that depicts men bearing poultry and joints of meats. The cycle of floods. Ancient Egyptians divided the year into three seasons of four months each. The new year began with the flooding of the Nile in July. This was the season of Aket. In November, as the waters receded, Peret, the plowing and planting season, began. The dry season, Shemu, lasted from March to July. Then crops were harvested and stored before the rains came again. The flood waters left a deposit of silt that fertilized the fields and produced abundant crops. Mud along the river bank was made into pots, jars. Tiles and other ceramics. People measured the rise and fall of the Nile's water level with an alometer, a series of marks on riverside rocks or cliffs. Farmers produced more than enough food for Egypt's people. The pharaoh's storehouses brimmed over with food they collected as taxes. Ancient Egypt has been called the granary, grain house, to the world. Grain and other crops were traded with neighboring peoples in Africa and Asia. A hunting relief from the Temple of Ramses the Second. Animal life. Ancient Egypt swarmed with animals that no longer live there. Hippopotamuses bobbed in the Nile and lounged along the shore. Lions wandered in from the desert for water. Baboons and wild cats screeched in the thickets, and herds of gazelles trotted by. Golden jackals scoured the valleys for animal and human remains. Great flocks of rose-colored flamingos swooped in to nest along the Nile, and red-breasted geese flew in to winter in the marshes. As the climate grew hotter and drier, human settlements spread, and these animals went away. We know they once lived there because Egyptians left paintings of them. Ancient animals that still live in Egypt include cobras, crocodiles, vultures, falcons, quails, and cows. Many animals were drawn in hieroglyphic symbols, and some were honored as gods. Hieroglyphs. Egyptians were writing with picture symbols called hieroglyphs as early as 3000 B.C. Some hieroglyphs represented an object. For example, wavy lines stood for water, and a bird was a bird. But a picture could also stand for an idea. Walking feet meant movement or the passage of time. Some hieroglyphic symbols were homophones, words that sound alike but have different meanings. For example, the pharaoh Narmer's name was written as N apostrophe R, fish, plus M R, chisel. Vowel sounds were often left out. Some symbols stood for sounds. Others showed whether a word was singular or plural, or a noun or a verb. By 300 B.C., the Egyptian alphabet consisted of more than 700 hieroglyphic symbols. A loop with the royal name inside it was called a cartouche. You can make your cartouche using the symbol shown in the hieroglyphic chart. Life everlasting. The age of 110 was believed to be the perfect lifespan, but it was more an ideal than a reality. Most people in those days did not live past their thirties, but every Egyptian, from pharaoh to laborer, believed in life after death. Given the proper burial rites, they could be immortal. The Egyptians believed that the jackal-headed god Anubis escorted each soul into the afterlife. Osiris, god of the underworld, made a final judgment by the weighing of the heart. A feather was put on one side of a scale, and the person's heart on the other side. If the heart was as light as the feather, the soul could enter eternity. Egyptians also believed that the dead would enjoy all their earthly comforts in the afterlife. Burial chambers were filled with favored possessions, clothes, 
furniture, games, and food. Even pet cats were preserved and buried with their masters. Mummies. After death, the body was made into a mummy to keep it from decaying. This ensured a successful journey into the afterlife. Mummification could take as long as seventy days. First, the body was packed in a salt called natron, which dried the tissues and kept them from breaking down. Then the internal organs were removed. Some were preserved in jars and buried with the body. Other organs were treated with herbs and were placed in the body. The brain, believed to be worthless, was thrown away. Embalming fluids and pastes were then applied to preserve the skin and the body's interior. Finally, the body was wrapped round and round with white linen strips. Mummies of some pharaohs were encased in jewel-encrusted gold and placed in a sarcophagus or stone coffin. In the burial chamber, scrolls of the Book of the Dead were buried with the body. They contained special prayers and instructions for getting through the mysterious world of the dead. Pyramids, to make sure they would have eternal life, pharaohs built fabulous tombs for themselves. The earliest pharaohs built tombs called mastabas, low, flat-topped mud brick structures with slanting sides. Djoser, a pharaoh of the third dynasty, wanted a more glorious tomb, so his architect Imhotep built the first pyramid. It is called a step pyramid because its sides are like stair steps. Djoser's step pyramid still stands at Zakara near Memphis. Fourth dynasty pharaohs built the most famous pyramids. The three pyramids of Giza, just west of Cairo, Khufu built the largest one, called the Great Pyramid, around 2600 B.C. Khufu's pyramid was made of limestone blocks covered with sheer granite slabs that glistened in the sun. People could slide right down the sides. In later centuries, the granite was removed to make buildings in Cairo. Khufu's son Khafre and the pharaoh Menkaur built the two other Giza pyramids. Nearby stands the Great Sphinx, a massive stone lion with the head of a man. How did they build the pyramids? The ancient Egyptians left only a few clues about how they built the pyramids. From rock quarries at Aswan, stone blocks were floated down the Nile on rafts for 500 miles, 800 kilometers. Then the blocks were probably put on runners like sleds and hauled up wooden or stone ramps. The Greek historian Herodotus says that 100,000 men worked on the Great Pyramid in three-month shifts. Then another 100,000 went to work. This went on for more than 20 years. How were the blocks lifted into place? According to Herodotus, they were lifted with a kind of crane that rested on lower-level stones. Kingdoms unite and divide. The history of ancient Egypt. May be divided into three major periods: the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Memphis was Egypt's capital during the Old Kingdom period, beginning around 2,686 B.C. Memphis lies about 15 miles, 24 kilometers south of what is now Cairo. Even in this early period, Egyptians were making paper from papyrus fibers and writing in hieroglyphs. In time, the pharaoh's power weakened, and Egypt once again broke into separate districts. Mentuhotep II pulled the kingdom together again around 2040 B.C. He built his capital at Thebes on the Nile's east bank in Upper Egypt. His reign marks the beginning of the Middle Kingdom period. During this time, construction began on the Temple of Amon at Karnak. Asian people. Called the Hyksos, rose to power in the 1600s B.C. They began ruling from their capital at Avaris in the Delta, and later spread to Thebes. Egyptians learned much about the art of war from these foreign rulers. The Hyksos introduced horse-drawn chariots, bronze and iron swords, and other military gear. The New Kingdom, conquests and construction. Amos, a Theban prince. Drove the Hyksos out in the 1500s B.C. This began the New Kingdom period, with Thebes as the capital. With their new military skills, Egyptians now became a major world power. Under Thutmose III, 
they took over Nubia, Palestine, Syria, and northern Iraq. New lands meant new sources of wealth. Slaves, exotic woods, ivory, and precious metals and stones poured into the pharaoh's warehouses. To show off their power, new kingdom pharaohs built huge temples, monuments, and statues of themselves. Ramses II, Ramses the Great, was the greatest builder of all. He built the temples of Abu Simbel and enlarged the temple at Karnak. Scholars also believe he was the pharaoh mentioned in the Bible's book of Exodus story, in which Moses led the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. For their tombs, new kingdom rulers built huge necropolises, or cities of the dead. These tomb sites were on the west bank of the Nile, across from Thebes. Today, they are named the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, and the Tombs of the Nobles. In 1995, archaeologist Kent Weeks discovered what may be the largest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It holds most of Ramses II's 52 sons. So far, about 60 tombs have been found in the Valley of the Kings, only a fraction of those waiting to be discovered. The Boy King We know about Tutankhamun, or King Tut, from his lavish tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Tutankhamun, the boy king reigned in the 1300s B.C. He died when he was about 18 years old. More than 5,000 objects were found in his tomb, including furniture, games, weapons, and a golden chariot. 